Hello, uh, welcome to Generation Rents webinar as part of Renters' Rights Awareness Week, uh, looking at students uh, and student renters. Uh, thanks uh, for everyone who's, who's joined. Uh, welcome to this session, which uh, we've, we've got uh, scheduled for the next hour. Um, my name is Dan Wilson Craw. I'm Deputy Chief Executive of Generation Rents. Uh, we are the national voice of private renters. We um, we're trying to represent everyone, everyone who rents uh, from private landlords in the UK uh, and campaigning for safe, secure and affordable homes. Um, we're, uh, I mean, over the past couple of years, uh, students have been facing really tough conditions as renters. Uh, and so we, yeah, we want to do a very specific uh, session for uh, aimed at students. So hopefully this will be uh, useful for you. Um, we, we're recording. Um, if you're um if if you if you're uh if you don't want your name to be uh included on on any um uh we we won't have your name uh any, anywhere on, on on the recording uh you can ask questions on the q a uh, recommend doing that on the q a which you should be able to see on your screen um and we uh after the first two presentations uh we will will ask uh questions to our panelists um, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce um, first Nick Coomba, uh, who is from the uh, Private Housing and Advice, uh, sorry, University of London Housing Advice Service. He is a private housing and advice team manager. Um, and uh, after after Nick speaks, we've got Al McLenahan, who is financial penalty training and a support leader at Justice for Tenants. Um, so uh, we'll have about uh 20 minutes uh from uh from them combined um and then uh there'll be an opportunity to ask questions so um uh i'll hand over to nick uh but yeah as as when you have questions coming in uh do pop them in the q a we'll uh we'll get to them later uh nick the floor is yours thank you thanks very much um i'll just uh see if i can share my screen um, I think it says, hi, here we are, brilliant. All right, one second. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that okay. Um, so yeah, that looks good to me. Okay, brilliant, thanks. So yeah, I'm Nick, uh, I'm the manager of the private housing advice team at the University of London Housing Services. Um, we're a service that gives private rented advice to students across London. Um, lots of different universities subscribe to our service. So if you are a London student, it's definitely worth having a look and seeing if, um, you know, potentially you can make use of our service. Um, in terms of what we do for students, um, we help students find accommodation. So we've got a um, property platform that students can use to find accommodation. All the landlords on there, we've checked they own the property or they have permission to let. Um, and they have signed our code of guidance. So it can be a, a good way for students to find hopefully reliable accommodation. Um, also, we help students find flatmates. We have events. We also have a flatmate finding group for students across London who um, are uni at universities that subscribe to our service. That can be useful if you've got, um, you want to look with other people potentially. Um, we have a contract checking service as well. So um, this is uh, where an advisor will actually go through your contract with you, make sure you understand it, point out anything that we think maybe is not quite right with it, um, and do some basic checks just to try and make sure that it's not a scam. Um, and we also do housing advice appointments. So if, for example, your landlord's maybe not done what they're supposed to do, they were supposed to maybe return your deposit or do some repair work, things like that, and it's not happened, then we can actually step in and help you with that. Um, we also have a private housing guide, which I just thought I'd mention here because it's accessible on our website to anyone. So it doesn't matter whether you subscribe to our service or not. Um, this will basically take you through right from when you're looking for accommodation, those very first steps um, through to when you're living there, uh, what your rights are, um, and also what to do kind of when it's ended and you need to get your deposit back, for example. So I highly recommend that. That is available on our website, housing.london.ac.uk. So when you're looking for accommodation, um, we do a whole uh, talk on this on our YouTube channel, actually, that's about 40 minutes long that goes through this in a lot more detail. But um, just briefly, I'll sort of go through the main things to think about. So 
we'd kind of split it into four things. So one is the type of accommodation that you want to rent. So I'll talk a bit more about this in a second. The second is your budget. This is probably going to be the thing that makes the most difference in terms of sort of where you're going to be able to live and what kind of accommodation that you can live in. Um, this is also going to tie massively to location. So a lot of students want to live right next to their campus or potentially right in the city centre if you're in a sort of city-based university. So um, if your budget is sort of not at the highest end, then you might find this a bit difficult. Um, we'd also suggest um, thinking carefully about who your flatmates are if you're able to. So it might be if you're living in halls with people, you're getting on really well. But when it comes to sort of living together, you need to think about do you have the same kind of ideas about what that's going to look like? Um, are they going to wash the, the dishes when you want them to? Are you going to be able to have quiet time to study if that's what you need? Or do you want to live in a big party house? You know, these are things you want to think about because every year we have casework where a student wants to leave their contract because they don't like their flatmates because um, they've all had a big argument or there's been a big bust up and they want to leave. But it can be very difficult um, once you've signed a contract to actually get out of it. So it's definitely something to think about in, in uh, advance. And in terms of what your options are, so... Um, generally students would in the private sector um, mostly be living in sort of flats and houses rented from a private landlord usually in a group very occasionally on sort of individual room tenancies um, so that's kind of the main um, focus I suppose of, of our work definitely um, and probably of like our housing guide and things like that we'll be talking through trying to find that kind of accommodation in the private sector but there are other options as well so there's student halls um, you may find some of these available run by your university but there's many many private hall providers as well that are basically doing similar kind of accommodation but from the private sector rather than renting from your university um, the benefit of a, a private hall is that they tend to include all of your bills so um, if you're worried about you know an unexpectedly high like kind of electricity bill or water bill for example that won't really be an issue if you're renting in private halls because you pay everything inclusive of, of your rent. So um, you'll know at the beginning how much you're going to have to pay and that won't change. Um, so that they're an advantage for that reason, but they can be quite expensive probably also for that reason. Um, I've also put resident landlords there just as a separate option there. And that's just because if you're a student who might struggle to get a guarantor, as you often will need a guarantor to rent in the private sector due to students not having a high income, um, resident landlords tend to be a little bit more relaxed about their requirements when it comes to things like referencing. So if you're somebody who thinks you might struggle to get a guarantor or to be able to afford to use like a guarantor scheme, for example, all of this we go into in more detail in our housing guide, um, then a resident landlord option just might be a better one to consider. It's not always like an older person. It could be like a student or a young person who maybe their parents have helped them buy a property to live in while they're studying. So it might be worth considering an option like that if, if you think that might be a problem for you. Um, I won't go through everywhere that you can look for accommodation, but these are some options potentially that you might use to try and find some accommodation. Um, if you're in London and, you're, and your university subscribes to our service, you can use our property platform. Um, but if not, then your university might have its own platform that you can use to find accommodation, which we'd recommend looking at. Um, there's lots of different websites, some of them more reliable than others. Um, I'm going to talk a bit more about scams in, in a minute, but generally nowhere is completely safe from scams. They've, they've been on every website that I've, I've seen, basically. Um, but some of them are more likely than others, particularly social media. So just make sure you're sort of thinking about whether things are too good to be true when you're looking at them. In terms of the rental market at the moment, so I've been working in the student accommodation sector for quite a few years now, and I would say the last two years have been probably the most difficult for students um, that I've seen when it comes to looking for accommodation. Um, lots of accommodation options that we would see in the past, um, like kind of uh, private halls, for example, that would still have lots of availability right up to kind of, you know, this time of year. Um, a full really early on, sometimes sort of before even like spring. Um, so what that means is there's like less properties around, there's a lot of competition, um, there's higher rents, and there's just sort of more pressure, I would say. And this isn't just for students, this is for anyone renting in the private sector, really. Um, the market can be quite competitive and you can feel quite rushed and things like you need to kind of make decisions very quickly, which can make things quite difficult. Um, just to say you're not alone if you are feeling this way, um, a lot of students are finding it hard. It's not anything that you're doing necessarily. It's just the way the market is at the moment and it can be quite difficult. 
Um, what can we do to kind of combat that? Well, it is difficult, but keep an open mind to areas and options you might not have considered normally. So, for example, if you're really hoping to be able to walk to university, it might be that you have to consider somewhere where you can't do that and you have to get public transport. Um, Try not to be pressured into going for something you know you can't afford. I think people get really desperate and they sometimes just sign a contract when they kind of know that it's not really going to be possible and they're going to end up in rent arrears. So try and really properly budget your money before you sign something. Um, it's sometimes better, in my opinion, to get short term accommodation for a few weeks while you're looking than to just take the first thing you find, because in these instances where someone's taken the first thing they find the second they get to the city that they they want to move to, um, they often end up in something that's non-ideal either because they can't afford it or because it's in a, a poor state. So um, we'd always recommend getting some short-term accommodation and doing some viewings rather than just signing a contract from far away or going for the first thing and try not to lose hope. Um, I did want to mention scams because this year especially we've seen probably the most scams I think I've ever ever seen in one year um, and they're getting more elaborate so I just wanted to talk a bit about it because they do particularly target students. Um, so Scammers are sort of posing as landlords or as legitimate letting agents and doing things like taking maybe six months rent in advance and deposits for properties that they don't have any kind of claim to and they have no intention to actually rent out. Um, in some cases, we've seen agents renting out Airbnb um, properties and then doing a whole load of viewings, um, taking money and then kind of disappearing. So this is even happening to students who have actually viewed the property that they were going to rent as well. Um, as I said, this has happened on lots of different websites, but I would say that social media is probably some of the riskier place for, uh, places for it, particularly Facebook. Um, I see a lot of classic scams on Facebook where people are offering very affordable accommodation, it seems, and asking for upfront deposits before they'll do viewings. That's a classic scam, so definitely be aware, aware of anything like that. Um, in terms of what you can do to kind of combat this a little bit, so be cautious, don't use money transfer services. These are a big red flag. So if anyone asks you to pay over Alipay or Western Union MoneyGram, that's generally a sign that they're probably not even based in the UK um, and very unlikely to have access to property in the UK for you to rent. So that is a, um, a sign of a scam for sure. Um, and just generally don't pay anything before you view the property. I know this is particularly difficult for international students, which is why we recommend short term accommodation. Um, but if someone's asking you to pay, particularly even before they'll do a viewing, um, then it's, it's usually a red flag. Um, when is something too good to be true? Because we often say to watch out when something seems too good to be true. So is the rent much lower than other similar properties? Um, can you suddenly afford somewhere in the city centre when you have no hope of it at all before? Um, it's likely to be a scam, um, particularly if they're including all bills for the whole property. That is very unusual. If you're renting a whole uh, flat or house and the bills are included, um, I, I see that very rarely um, in a legitimate listing. Um, if you're being pressured to pay a lot up front, um, I'd also check that the, the landlord on the contracts um, that that name is the same as the, the bank details you've been given, because occasionally suddenly this sort of other name exists on the payment and you don't really know where that's come from. That's often a sign of a scam as well. And also a common thing I see, particularly with these kind of Facebook scams where people are asking for money up front before they'll do a viewing. Um, if a landlord's sending you a copy of their own passport um, or driving license, this is usually a sign that they probably sort of taken that through identity fraud and they're trying to kind of pass themselves off as someone else. A legitimate landlord, it'd be very rare for them to want to send you their own identification. Um, so I, I've never seen that happen in a legitimate case before. Just very quickly, I just want to touch on letting agents as well. So um, any letting agent that you deal with has to belong to a redress scheme. So this is like a scheme that kind of uh, has a code of guidance letting agents have to sign up for and you can go to them if you've got a complaint about them. So there's only two that, um, that are actually uh, fun uh, operational in the, the UK. So um, that's the Property Redress Scheme and the Property Ombudsman. So I've put their logos there. You can go on those websites and you can search for the letting agent that you're dealing with. And if they're not registered on there, then they're not operating legally. So um, that is a, a major red flag if they're not in a redress scheme. Um, but also, more recently, they've been required to belong to a client money protection scheme. Um, client money protection scheme websites are not quite as good as the redress scheme ones in that not all of them allow you to search for members, but 
any letting agent should have their certificate for their client money protection scheme available for you to look at. And if they don't have one, then that is a major red flag. Um, we have unfortunately recently seen scams from letting agents who actually were in redress schemes, but they, I've never seen one from an agent that was in a client money protection scheme. So that is a really crucial thing to look for when you're dealing with a letting agent. And also they can't charge illegal fees. So anyone who's trying to charge you for a viewing, trying to charge you for a contract, anything like that, um, they should be avoided because they're not operating legitimately. Um, just briefly as well, checks you can do if you're worried about scams. So make sure you've Googled the agent or landlord that you're going to rent through. Um, occasionally, um, people will post when they've been scammed by someone online. I've seen posts on all sorts of places, but it's just come up on Google, um, on the reviews or on things like LinkedIn, etc. cetera. Um, so I would uh, just make sure you've done that just to make sure nothing kind of comes up that's very concerning. Um, you can check the landlord owns the property. So you can do this by going on the land registry. It costs three pounds, but you can look at who owns any property basically in the whole of the UK just by looking at the address. So I uh, strongly recommend that. Um, also I would suggest looking on company's house just to see how recently the, agents has, have, the agent has been established because this is a good way of seeing if they're really recently established. It's sort of harder to know how reliable they are. Um, check for address scheme membership, check for client money protection scheme. Okay, and this is my last slide. I did say very briefly that I would talk about repairs today. So um, I've just put one on here for you quickly. So um, your landlord, when you when you move in, if you, it turns out that things are kind of not quite right, lots of things are broken, your landlord generally is legally required to do those repairs. So anything related to like the structure of the property, plumbing, the boiler, things like that. Um, if there's something wrong with it, your landlord should be repairing it. Um, if they try and say, oh, you know, I don't have to do that. I've not written that in the contract. It doesn't matter whether it's in the contracts or not, because it is the law. They do have to do it. Um, as a tenant, you've still got to do really minor repairs like changing light bulbs, um, changing smoke alarm batteries. But other than that, it really should be your landlord's responsibility. So um, make sure you report anything like that in writing to the landlord. And if you find they're not doing it, you can approach your local council, either the private rented team or sometimes it's called the environmental health team. Um, and they can help you usually um, so they can contact your landlord and try and get them to actually do the repairs for you. Okay, so that's everything from me. Um, as I said, I would highly recommend you look at our housing guide um, on housing.london.ac.uk. Um, you can also look us up on YouTube. We've got a couple of videos about different things that you might find helpful. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. Brilliant. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Nick. Uh, that was fantastic. Um, and really interesting to hear about the scams because that's it's one of those areas that is constantly changing. Um, it, it is, there's new, as you say, elaborate uh, ways that people are, the criminals are trying to take advantage of people. Um, one of the things um, that we, we, we saw a, a news story last, maybe, maybe it was a year ago, um, where a scammer was actually posing as the letting agent, like a legitimate letting agent, um, and uh, had managed to take someone's money um, but I think, but it seems like the person could have could have just phoned the letting agent as listed on the on the internet, like by googling them, um, mm -hmm. and and realised that they're not that that they, they weren't actually being um, on it, you know, weren't being yeah. represented by this this person. So yeah, there's um, there's we've a lot seen of... at least sort of I would say five of those kind of cases this right. year, and that's it's a lot of money that people are losing. So yeah, absolutely, it's yeah. useful to do those checks if you can. Well, th yeah, thanks very much. Um, we'll, we'll move on now. Um, we've got uh, Al McLenaghan, uh, who is here from Justice for Tenants, um, and he'll explain a bit about what uh, they do and what uh, what laws are in place to protect renters. Al. Thank you very much, Dan, and also thank you, Nick. That was incredible. Everyone should uh, have, to, have to see that before they rent. It would save a lot of heartache. Um, yeah, I'm Al McLenaghan. I work at the non-profit organisation Justice for Tenants. And um, we take a reasonable amount of legal action on behalf of tenants against criminal landlords and letting agents. And I thought I'd talk about the most accessible ways that you might realistically find yourself taking legal action if you faced uh, issues. And for this, I spoke to our office manager uh, and said, you know, what's the most common issues that, that the student population face and the most common legal action that we take? And they fall into two categories, deposit protection breaches and rent repayment orders. And to give an idea, um, 
over the last five years, uh, we've actually recovered a t- touch over £6 million of rent or compensation for tenants through these types of legal actions. So they're, they're pretty common uh, and, they're, and they're very much possible to do. Um, and that's why I wanted to focus on these, because these are the most likely ones that you'll face. So I'll start off with deposit protection. And I'll briefly cover what the rules are around it and then how you can take legal action when how to know if, if the law has been broken. Um, Nick touched on kind of the three different kinds of tenancy that you can have in, in England. There's only three kinds of tenancy in law. You're either basically what's generally known as a lodger, where you're living with the person who owns the property, maybe they're renting a room, maybe you're staying with a family. Um, if you are, this doesn't apply. Or you can be a, a licensor, a, li- a licensee, which is if you're maybe just renting like a room or a hotel room um, in a house share. Uh, but almost everyone, the vast majority of tenants in England are short, shorthold tenants. And that is where you have the right the whole room or the whole property for a period of time and you pay rent, often called an AST. And if you're on a short, shorthold tenant um, and you're asked to pay a security deposit, so that's money where the landlord will keep it in case you break the contract in some way, like you don't pay rent or you, you damage the property more than wear and tear, then they can retain some of that money at the end. But it used to be really common that landlords would just keep money, even if there wasn't a reason. So the government introduced tenant deposit schemes. So now when you pay, let's say you pay a thousand pounds a month in rent, and before that you have to pay a 1200 pound security deposit. Your deposit within 30 days of you paying it, nothing to do with when your tenancy starts, within 30 days of you paying it, it must be protected in a government approved deposit protection scheme. There are three of them. The one's called the DPS, the Deposit Protection Service. One's called the TDS, the Tenancy Deposit Scheme. And the third one's called My Deposit. Those are the only places they have to be protected in there within 30 days of you paying it. And within that same 30 days, you have to be given what's called prescribed information. That's information from the scheme, which lets you know where you can find your deposit. And you can check on the schemes online just to find your deposit put in your name, put in the amount, and it says, there you go, we've got it. But it also, that prescribed information tells you what to do. If at the end of the tenancy, your landlord says, I think you've caused loads of damage, I want to keep £1,000, and you don't agree with them. And the idea is, instead of having to go to court, which is sometimes tricky to do, you go to the deposit scheme, and the deposit scheme has an independent person who will hear both sides and allocate how much money there is. And they're broadly quite favourable to the tenant. The landlord has to prove that they're entitled to the money. So that's why the scheme exists. So you could live in the property, move out, get all your deposit back, and then up to six years after you pay the deposit, if you find out that the deposit wasn't protected in a scheme within 30 days, or you weren't given prescribed information within 30 days, it doesn't matter if it's protected later, um, you're entitled to compensation. And that is compensation of a minimum of one time the deposit and a maximum of three times the deposit. If your deposit was a thousand pounds, the court would have to award a minimum of one thousand and a maximum of three thousand pounds. Now it's heard in court, but because these are quite open and shut cases, there's a number of solicitors firms, I know we work with a number of them, um, where they will take the case on on what's called a no win, no fee basis. So the idea is if you know it's a thousand pound deposit. They'll take the case on, maybe the judge awards £2,000, and they'll take a quarter of that, usually 25%. So they'll take £500, they recover their own legal costs from the landlord, and you'll get £1,500. Um, and a lot of this action goes on, and it is uh, very successful almost all of the time. Then we have rent repayment orders. So this is, um, these are relatively new, uh, and, and we, we do about, probably represent about two, 3,000 tenants a year, to about 500 of these. In England, you have your Her Majesty's Court and Tribunal Service. You have the courts and you have the tribunals. And the courts are a little bit more kind of, a little bit more like rigid. They're kind of what you see on TV where you've got a judge and it's kind of there sitting up high and there's lots of rules. So the tribunal came into effect after the war where basically people realised the court system wasn't very accessible for the everyday person. The tribunal's designed to be very flexible to help you exercise your legal rights. And it's a situation where there's an inherent power and money balance. 
like a landlord, we own spare property, and a tenant, we rent the property. It means that you basically don't have much of a risk of having to pay the other side's legal costs, so you can't be scared into not taking action. And by our legal services standard, it's super fast. And the point that you apply for a rent repayment order to the point that you have a hearing is usually about 14 or 15 weeks, which three months, four months might not sound very fast, but trust me, in law, that is unbelievably quick. And if you're successful, the tribunal judge will order your landlord to repay you up to, at the moment, 12 months rent, but, and in large part, this is due to the campaigning work of generation rent. In the new legislation, the Renters' Rights Bill comes in next year, around May next year, probably, up to two years of rent back. So if you paid a thousand pounds a month in rent, and you find your landlord broken the law, and you've been there over two years, you may well find that you can be awarded up to 24,000 pounds of rent back. So it's really significant. And I'm just going to cover kind of the most common times that you're entitled to a rent repayment order. Um, and, and it's probably the same for Nick, but often when tenants have complaints and we look into it, there's some laws that have been broken. The most common is property licensing. So um, if you're sharing with other students, and there's five of you, your property is what's called a house of multiple occupation or an HMO. Every single property in the country, if there's five people sharing, and you're not all part of the same family, needs a license. That license is meant to ensure good management. Fire safety features are the main thing. It will have a license, and that license will usually be on the wall as soon as you enter the property. England is split up into lots of different councils at small geographical areas. Some councils will require every property with three sharers to have a license. And some will just require every rented property to have a license. You can Google the name of your council. So I live in Barnet. So I put Barnet Landlord Licensing Schemes, and it will tell me all the schemes that exist. If it looks like your property needs a license and you don't see a license anywhere in the property, you can email your council's housing team. As Nick mentioned, they're sometimes called an environmental health team and say, I live in this property with this many people. Can you tell me if the property has a license? Can you tell me if anyone's applied for a license? If they didn't and it needed one, you're entitled to apply for your rent back the entire time that you lived there up to, at the moment, one year, soon, two years' time. It doesn't actually matter what the condition of the property is because the main thing is that license, make sure the conditions are good, make sure the management is good. There are some other reasons that you can recover one or two years of rent. Uh, and this one's going to become really important when the law changes at the moment. If you complain about conditions, sometimes a landlord will serve what's called a Section 21 notice, which basically says you've got to leave at the end of the tenancy. They don't have to give a reason. The law will, will change soon, and to most people, that won't be the case. So you can complain to the council if there's an issue with the property. And the council can come round, and if they say, yeah, there is really bad damp, or there is really bad mould, they can serve something called an improvement notice. And that means that the landlord has to fix that issue in a certain period of time. And if they don't, then you can apply for your rent to be repaid for the period of time that it's not fixed when it should have been. Also, if your landlord unlawfully evicts you or harasses you, they themselves, the landlord themselves, does it. Can't really do it if it's an agent or someone you don't know. But, you know, the landlord just changes the lock, sends you a message, I told you, you know, I'm going to change the lock, I needed you to leave to recover your rent. A couple of things to note, you do have to prove that the landlord broken the law to the criminal standard. That doesn't tend to be too difficult if you know how. And there may actually be a whole bunch more um, reasons why you can apply for your rent back, why you can get a rent repayment order after this new legislation, the Rent of Rights Bill comes into force. Um, and you can get assistance from a number of places, from JFT if you're using um, Nick's service, and I'm pretty sure they, they can give advice there. They've got a lot of experience with this as well. But those are the two main reasons that students are able to take legal action and they're both very accessible kinds of legal action, kind where you don't just feel like I'm on my own, I haven't got any support and I don't know how to navigate it. You can get support with these two. Um, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks very much, Sarah. Um, 
Thanks very much, Al. That was really, really helpful and very, uh, very thorough um, uh, summary of what uh, what you can do. What, yeah, it's, it's. I think both these both these areas are um, they're not kind of obvious to 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 renters that that these rights exist, especially if you've got a landlord who is not in a, um, you know, like another kind of landlord who who will kind of volunteer up information about what what your rights as a renter are so um yeah it can be really difficult to get uh uh get get that information out out to the out to the people who need it um so uh we've got um we've got half an hour um for for some questions um i've got a few um which i uh which i can i can ask but uh we do actually have uh have something here um uh, a question uh from uh from one of the uh, uh people on the webinar uh about just about it being recorded uh, it is being recorded we're going to be uh, putting it on on youtube um so uh we uh um we'll, we'll we'll have that up in the next few days um but i'll um i'll crack on <laughs> so yeah if, if 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 anyone watching has has any questions do uh, pop them in the q and a and um uh, and I'll I'll put them to to Nick and Al, uh, but I've got a few yeah I've got a few questions uh, just from from your presentations uh, that um, it'd be interesting to get interesting to get your thoughts on. Um, I suppose um, Nick, just you, you mentioned um, students. Uh, a lot of students find themselves in a position where they want to move out of their tenancy during the um, during the fixed term. Um, and I guess the it, it, is there anything that, ten, that students in that sort of situation or, or any tenants should know about um, about moving out is I, I'm, I'm aware that it's, it's one of the few reasons that you can be charged a fee by yes. agents as well. Yeah, so I mean it firstly, I, I think students sometimes don't fully understand their contracts and um, especially if they see the bit at the end after the fixed term where you can give sometimes like a month's notice, you know, to leave, leave the property. Um, and they confuse that with me thinking they can just give a month's notice and leave their, their room. Um, so if you're in a joint contract with lots of other people, you're something called jointly and severally liable, which basically means that all of you, say if there's four of you and you're all renting one room each um, for say 500 pounds a month, and it totals uh, 2,000 pounds. So all of you are actually jointly responsible for that full 2,000 pounds. You're not um, sort of just renting your, your little quarter of that, your 500 pounds. So what that means is that if you, you, you leave, um, potentially you know, your friends who you are living with could get charged the rent money that you, you're no longer paying. So you can't just end your quarter of the contract you actually it's a whole contract for all of you so either the whole contract ends or your part just has to really be transferred to someone else so we would recommend students in that position if it's just one person that wants to leave um, they look for a replacement tenant um, and in that case you can be charged a fee by your letting agent and it's usually capped at 50 pounds um, according to the guidance although some agents will try and charge more than this but they have to kind of evidence it if they do attempt to do that um, but yeah you have to pay that money and then you can um, potentially find a replacement the issue we often find is that midway through an academic year it's actually not very easy to find a suitable replacement um, you know students tend to find something at the beginning of the academic year and stay there till the end. So hopefully you'd be lucky, but you just also have to bear in mind that if you find somebody who's not a student, that will make potentially council tax chargeable for the property. So um, if you're all full-time students, the property probably wouldn't have had any council tax chargeable at all, but as soon as one professional lives there, then 75% of that is of that bill would be due. So it can be quite expensive. Um, for sort of everyone potentially remaining in the property so yeah quite a few things to consider which is why we sort of really like to stress that if you're signing a contract with a group of people really you want to be able to stick it out for the full fixed term um, because if you don't it can make things very difficult and we do have students who leave for whatever reason and then end up having to pay even when they weren't living there because a replacement wasn't found um, so very important to consider that 
Great. Thanks very much, Nick. Um, Al, uh, obviously, there's these couple of couple of things around um, taking legal action against against landlords. Um, is there anything, anything if, if so if if a, if a tenant is is thinks they they've got a good case, um, but obviously, I, I suppose taking a landlord to, to court or, or or through a tribunal is still quite you know potentially quite an intimidating process. Uh, and there, and there are costs involved. Like you want to make sure you're putting, putting down some money. You've got, a, you've got as strong a case as possible. What's the, what are the things that a tenant would needs to needs to think about um, before before deciding whether to hit send on the email or application form? Yeah. Well, to be honest, I often think like um, a really good way of doing it is to make sure you really understand what your rights are before you kind of first take that first step so um you you mentioned a bit a bit earlier dan um you know dealing with landlords who might not be upfront with you about what your rights are and i often think that um our advice team says that sometimes there's issues where you know as, as a tenant particularly if, if you're a student particularly if you know you're maybe a bit younger um you haven't had as much experience with renting so it's hard to know what's correct and what's not and I think it's really important to make sure that you're getting advice, not from someone, not from your landlord, not from your letting agent. You're understanding they're not someone that you can trust because they might be the people who are breaking the law. So organization, you know, JFT, Nick service, shelter, uh, checking that you've read it kind of all online and, and, and kind of not kind of playing tennis where you're saying to your landlord, oh, well, I, I read this and then they get an opportunity to convince you otherwise but really making sure you fully understand your rights and if possible you've spoken through what the course of action is that you're going to take and what you intend to take and where possible it actually can be a real stress reliever to kind of take that out of your hands so I know with our, our rent repayment order team does pro probably represents a bit, a bit over 2,000 tenants a year um, for rent repayment orders and I know that it, it it tends to be a less stressful experience when you're just saying I've given all the evidence that I need. Now you deal with interacting with my landlord. I don't want that stress. And that can be, if you're doing a deposit protection claim, that can be the same thing. You can use a solicitor's firm, but just making sure you're getting your advice from a reliable source and you're thinking ahead as to what is it that I want to do rather than, well, I'll do this next step and I'll send this threatening email to my landlord, but not think about what I'll do depending on, on the reaction to that. So just having a plan, making sure you're getting advice from a good place and you're thinking through what you actually want. And if you do find it stressful, maybe have a, having someone kind of do the representation for you so you don't have to interact with the person that you're taking legal action against. Brilliant. Thanks, Al. Um, I've got a follow-up question, actually, to that. Um, so I think both, I think I'm right in thinking that both the failure to protect the deposit and the failure to be licensed protects the tenant from um section 21 eviction notice um which i suppose i mean yeah i, I guess my question is is that to, to what extent is that a big consideration for for, for tenants because i suppose if if a landlord gets taken to court and then realizes they have to protect the deposit they can protect it and then i mean you might get your compensation but you might then uh, get a valid um eviction notice yeah, well, it's actually a major reason why these breaches in law come up. Um, so it's, it's quite common, especially because, you know, Nick, Nick touched on it, we all know it, rents are absolutely insane at the minute, it's so hard to afford. So a lot of people have faced massive rent rises, which they can't afford, and they get a Section 21 notice, and they go for advice, what can I do about it? And, and you know, at, at JFT, the first thing we check are, well, what are the bits of the law that the landlord needs to have complied with? Did they give you a gas safety certificate? Did they give you an energy performance certificate? Did they protect your deposit? Did the property have a license if it needed one? And often these kind of legal breaches come up initially as a way to um, defend against that Section 21 no-fault eviction. Uh, and then it kind of often turns into something where the Section 21 eviction is defended against. And then you take legal action for these other breaches of law and you actually get enough money in from that to be able to afford the deposit on a new place. Uh, and it's quite quite useful in that circumstance. Um, but often it's the Section 21 notice and looking for ways to push back against it that uncover these, these kind of breaches of law. 
Great, thanks very much. Um, uh, we've had another question. We've had a question in. Um, it's uh, related actually to the to leaving your contract early. Um, so so to, to Nick. Um, so uh, I know some students have been charged more than fifty pounds to leave their contract early. Is there any advice uh, we can give about this? Sure. So, I mean, it depends exactly what the scenario was. So I think I didn't quite finish my thought on this earlier, but if you are, if you're all wanting to leave, um, then the charge can be more. So if that was the circumstance where they all wanted to leave early and they were still in the fixed term, then the costs are actually really expensive. Um, it can be like the full advertising costs and the commission and stuff that the landlord was supposed to pay. So it can be quite a lot of money when it all mounts up. But if it was in the case where it was just one one or two people wanting to leave out of a, a contract that was still ongoing um, and they just did a kind of a straight swap between sharers, then um, it can be more than £50, but only if it's considered to be a reasonable cost and there's sort of written evidence of it. The definition of reasonable isn't really defined, so you kind of have to make the argument yourself. But if you think something is unreasonable, my first instance for kind of complaints is the agent themselves and then if you can't get anywhere with that I would go to the redress scheme because actually in my experience the redress schemes are actually quite good for um, getting tenants a bit of money back in cases where they've been sort of unfairly treated by a letting agent and also letting agents absolutely hate it when a complaint gets to that stage they don't they don't want it to get there and it's often because the schemes actually charge them for the cost of, of dealing with it so um yeah if you complain and say i'm going to take this to re the redress scheme very likely in a lot of cases that you will just get some money back because they want it to go away um but if it doesn't i would go to the redress scheme next if that doesn't work then you can in theory go to the tribunal over this but it really just depends on like how much effort someone would want to put into it i've never taken anything like this that far um, I think your local trading standards also could probably give you some advice about it because they're the ones who are supposed to be kind of regulating whether these fees are being charged illegally or not. Um, but I don't know about anyone else, but depending completely on the postcode that something's happening in, happening in, I find completely different responses from trading standards. So it really just depends. It's a bit of a postcode lottery. But yeah, those would be my, my first steps of it anyway. Yeah, one thing that we've uh, found is... <clears throat> We we campaigned for the letting the tenant fees act, uh, which came in five years ago. Um, and then since then we've been able to see, um, through the tribunal, publishing its decisions. You can actually see, you know, what sorts of cases are going to the tribunal in terms of yeah unfair fees, um, and uh, and so yeah, even if you don't go through the tribunal, you can sort of see what what is reasonable, what what is considered reasonable what's worth appealing, I suppose. Um, we've got uh, another question. What would you recommend doing if a housemate in an HMO refuses to pay their share of the bills? Um, Nick, have you got any thoughts on that? Um, this can be a tricky one. Um, if, if It depends if their name is on it or not, I suppose. Um, in a HMO, it might be a situation where it's, the landlord has the bills and, and they're paying, in which case it, I guess it probably wouldn't affect the housemates. But if it's where you're in a joint contract, then it can get quite tricky if your name is on the bill and theirs isn't because you're the one who is sort of legally liable for it when it comes to the actual utility provider. Um, we don't actually give a lot of advice on this because usually it's a conflict of interest because if it's, if it's two students, they're both entitled to our, our um, advice, so we can't do it. But I think you probably would have some degree of um, sort of hope for taking it as a small claim potentially against them because if you even if you only agreed verbally that they would pay a share of the bills, I think it would make a pretty good argument in a small claim that, you know, as a as a sharer, they were expected to pay towards the utilities in the property. Um, so it might be worth a go. Um, however, you'd want to have a look at who the person was that they were taking to small claims court and how likely they were to actually recover the money before you you went ahead with that. Because if you don't know, for example, where they've moved to or you don't think they've got any assets they can potentially just not pay and then you've wasted a lot of time so it's one of those things really um but it is possible in theory thanks al do you want to come in yeah 100 percent agree with everything nick said the only thing I'm, I'd, I'd maybe add is um 
do have to still make sure that that, that utility bill is paid because um, the utility companies, it's just a process for them. If the bill isn't paid, they don't, they don't care if it's ours, mate, it's not paid part of it. They'll just say, right, who are the names on the bill? Start our process for legal action. Um, and especially if you've moved on from a property as well, you might not even be aware of it and you might find trying to rent a property a year later and it turns out you've got a county court judgment against you for a tiny bill that you knew nothing about. So it's also useful, just quite good advice to make sure you check that all bills are properly closed down at the end. But if you, what Nick said is exactly right, but also just make sure that that bill is paid if you can. Um, we've we've heard stories about tenants. I mean, um, yeah, maybe, maybe this is something either you might have a, have a view on, but we, we've heard of tenants who have found that they've moved out. Their landlord has put their, their they were living in a, in a home that they thought they were paying the bills on, um, and unbeknownst to them, the landlords put their name on the on the water uh, on the water bill, um, and then probably uh very shady kind of uh landlords that, that aren't aren't actually you know probably in a lot of financial difficulty but um just yeah trying to avoid uh de debts but then the tenant the tenant ends up um getting their name on this unpaid bill um uh which yeah we probably, had... probably an unusual situation but We've had sort of cases where maybe the landlord's not repaired a leak, for example, and the, the tenant's on a water meter and it's made a, a bill go sort of insanely high. And it's a similar case in those situations. You have to actually just pay the bill and then kind of try and get the money out of the landlord later, which feels really unfair, but that is the way that it works at the moment. So, yeah, kind of a lot of things along those lines tend to happen with utilities, unfortunately. Yeah. Um I've got another question. Um, you mentioned guarantors earlier, Nick. Uh, there's, and, and and you mentioned that yeah, um, finding a, a living landlord may be a maybe an option. But can you elaborate on sort of what other what support there might be for for students? Sure. You know, yeah. So this this can be a, a major sticking point actually for a lot of students, and um, because. The, especially international students, because a guarantor generally has to be a UK resident. And I think in the past they had to be a homeowner as well, but they've kind of changed it a bit now to be more about income as well. Um, but if you don't have, say, parents who are living in the UK who can be your guarantor, or maybe your parents just don't meet the, the kind of required um, thing for it, then uh, potentially this can be quite difficult and it can make renting really difficult. Um, there are deposit, uh, sorry, not deposit, guarantor schemes that exist. So um, the main kind of private one is called Housing Hands, but it is quite expensive. It works out quite expensive for students to use it, but they'll basically act as a guarantor for you if you pay them quite a lot of money, basically. Um, your university might have a guarantor scheme. Um, these have kind of become a bit more common over the last few years. Um, either they'll partner with someone like Housing Hand or they'll have their own one where they will act as the guarantor themselves. Um, but in many instances, this just isn't, uh, this doesn't work for students for whatever reason. We have landlords who will refuse to take university guarantor schemes for no particular reason. Um, but what tends to happen in those situations is that students end up having to pay rent up front. So um, that's normally six months rent in advance. Um, I very rarely see it be less than that. Um, some landlords will ask for more, but we would normally advise you not to pay more than six months rent in advance. Um, partly for the reasons I mentioned earlier, scam related, but hopefully it, it would never get that far with that amount of money. But it's also for things like if the landlord is paying a mortgage um, and you've paid 12 months rent up front and the landlord, for whatever reason, stops paying their mortgage, um, then potentially you could be evicted before the end of that 12 months that you've already paid for. So. Um, we try and limit it to six if at all possible. But as I mentioned before, because of the kind of strain on the market at the moment and the difficulty students are having, they don't always have the luxury of choice of saying, actually, no, I'm not going to pay 12 months in advance. So it's definitely kind of a landlord's market at the moment in that respect. They can kind of set the, uh, the requirements and students kind of have to just try and deal with them as best they can. Right. Thanks very much. Um, we've got 10 minutes left and uh, three questions have come in. So um, uh, maybe uh, we can, I'll, I'll, I'll go through them very quickly and then and then we'll wrap up. 
Um, so the first one is uh, possibly one either of you could you uh, could answer. Um, I've heard lots about landlords keeping some of the deposit by charging for things like cleaning or damage beyond wear and tear, where everything was actually left fine. Do you have any advice on things like this? No. Yeah, so um, generally speaking, whenever leaving a property, I always suggest taking photographs from all four corners of every room, down and up, because you want your own evidence of the condition, because you might know it's the case, but you can't prove it's the case that you left it in a good condition. If you can't resolve a dispute over deductions at the end, that's what the deposit schemes are there for. And the best way to present information to the deposit schemes are to remember the landlord has to prove that there was damage beyond fair wear and tear. You don't have to prove that there was. So it's often to say, uh, we dispute that the damage was caused by us. And if, if that's not the case, then we dispute that it was beyond fair wear and tear. And furthermore, you can say, we dispute the amount that is being deducted for it. And you can also say how old you think the item was. It's very common. Um, Let's say there's a, a massive red wine stain that you've put on the carpet. If that carpet's eight years old, every deposit scheme will publish how long items are meant to last. And it will say carpets should be replaced every six years. So you can say, we believe that carpet was over six years old and therefore it has no value left and there shouldn't be any deduction. And it's important that you do it in an itemized way following that approach of dispute the damage. If it is, we dispute that the deduction is reasonable. We dispute the age of it. And just on every single item, just repeat all of those. So you're putting the landlord to the test on all those different elements. And you might find that actually a lot of those items are older than you think, or the landlord can't prove what they actually spent on them. Uh, and then they're not entitled to much of that money back. So that approach generally means that you'll get the vast majority of the disputed amount of money back. Um, really important that you, if you're not getting anywhere with the landlord soon after the, tenant, the tenancy has ended, that you go to the deposit scheme and start that process. I think it's after 90 days after the tenancy ends, you don't have an option to use that dispute scheme and then you're faced with court or nothing. And often landlords and agents will kind of spin it out, stretch it out. If you feel like you're getting messed around, have in your head, if I don't get this deposit back within 20 days after the tenancy has, end, have end, has ended, I'm starting a dispute and you won't go too far wrong. It generally works out in your favour to have someone independent who's going to broadly say the landlord has to prove this, these damages rather than trying to deal with that landlord yourself. Yeah, I think um, I, I, I've heard, I have heard uh, somewhere, and maybe I should check this um, before we put this up on YouTube. But um, I, if if you feel you've been str getting strung along, just go straight to the deposit scheme um, uh, rather than wait any longer. That's that's some advice I've heard before. Um, but I'll 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 confirm that before we uh, before we put put this up. Um, the uh, the next question I've got. Uh, thanks for that. Al. Um, I've lived in a house before that has that had severe mold and damp issues and know people in similar situations. Please, could you advise what to do for current and past tenants? We sent evidence over the course of the year and they did not take sufficient action, leading to uh, m multiple of us getting ill. Um, presumably that was to the uh, sending evidence to the, to the landlord. Um, Nick, do you have any thoughts on that? Sure. Yeah. I mean, if if they're really not doing anything and you've sent a lot of evidence and that is the time to try and take it to the local authority. Um, again, this is a little bit of a, a postcode lottery in my experience. Some of them will be better than others. Some people will be lucky and get a really responsive one, but it is worth trying at least a couple of times to get in touch with your environmental health uh, team on the, the local council and seeing if they will come out and inspect. Um, it's really useful um, to have that report if they are able to come out because um, not only can they sort of oblige the landlord to do repairs on, on the damp and mould, but also that is evidence that you can have potentially to take as a as a claim if you later were to make a disrepair, disrepair claim against them. Um, making a disrepair claim is probably not the most simple thing in the world compared to say um, going to the tribunal for a rent repayment order or doing a deposit scheme kind of claim, it's a lot more complicated. Ideally, you would want to get advice for it um, because it's it's difficult to know whether a claim is really worth what you think it is, for example. So I definitely wouldn't advise going ahead with one. But sometimes if, if it was a really bad um, case of disrepair, damp and mould, and the landlord didn't do anything about it for a long time, these can be quite... Um, 
like uh, these can be worth quite a lot, these claims basically. So um, either you could speak to sort of an advice agency of some sort that you have access to, um, or some solicitors also would see you for an appointment for not that much money, or potentially they will do, some will do things on like a no win, no fee basis. Um, but yeah, if the priority is getting the repair done, then I would say it's going to the council as soon as possible. Um, and also letting the letting agent and landlord know that you're going to do that because again they they don't like it very much so if they know you're going to do that then they know you mean business i guess great um thanks and al uh, do you recommend one? yeah just to follow on again great advice from nick uh, there's a advice that our team gives to people about just what those steps should be and they're exactly in line with what nick said but it's often Make sure that you're making all complaints about this repair in writing, so in an email often with the evidence. And then that first chase, if nothing's done, should be about a week later. And it should say, you know, in a week, I'm going to report it to the to the local authority, to the council. And then when you report it to the council, the best way to get action is to not only send the evidence, but give a timeline. Here's where the fault came. Here's when I emailed the landlord. Here's an attachment showing that email to the landlord. Here's a chase to the landlord. Here's nothing that had been done. And if you think they've damp a mould, you can say, I believe that there is what's called a category one hazard. It's an immediate risk to, uh, to my and my other occupants' health. And that triggers a duty where the council has to come out and investigate it. So particularly with damp mould, laying out really clearly so they can see there's an issue. The landlord's definitely been told about it. This, this tenant's able to lay it out really clearly so they'll be easy to work with. They've got the evidence. Um, and there's a category one hazard, so it might trigger the duty, can be really helpful. And, you know, I mentioned Section 21 notices were often a reason deposit protection breaches and rent repayment orders came around. Well, actually, the main one is disrepair, because if you've got a landlord who's not complying with their minimum legal obligations to make a home fit for a human to live in, there's a very good chance they're not protecting the deposit, there's a very good chance they haven't got a license if they need one, because if they did, the property probably wouldn't be in that condition. Um, so often it may not be that, you know, Nick mentioned the, the difficulty sometimes with disrepair claims, but often that is a portal to an easier claim for compensation. So a lot of the rent repayment orders we do, it's for a breach of licensing, but the tenant's bringing them because the landlord wouldn't fix the damp and mould, but um, it's just that's the way the law kind of works. We've had a few of those as well. It's often the way. You know, they start off with a disrepair problem and we end up doing a rent repayment order. So yeah, it's a really good point. And also it will often get you more money at the kind of rent repayment order stage if your landlord's kind of not done a load of repairs. And um, the other thing I, that I just thought of from your bit as well there, Al, was just that if you find that the council still aren't doing anything, sometimes even when they have a duty, that doesn't necessarily mean that it happens. Um, I would always suggest getting in touch with your local councillor um, because if you start involving them, then sometimes things will just kick into motion so yeah that's another thing you can do as well that's that's so helpful thanks both of you um i'll see, see if i can squeeze in this final question um can, can anyone advise if the landlord agrees to rent to a student with accessibility needs and, uh, and alterations need to be done under what obligations does the landlord have to do those necessary and reasonable adjustments um without the tenant believing they are being discriminated if the flat is not given to them um that makes sense does it anyone have any thoughts on that nick if you've got a clear idea on this i'll, I'll leave this to you but I've, I've got my thoughts on it yeah i think um, i'm not really i don't have a lot of experience with this particular thing with adjustments so if you do have something to come in with feel free yeah so i, I i'm i'm not 100 percent certain on this first of all but i know broadly speaking um let's say you have an elderly tenant they go into hospital and they need to be discharged from hospital but they need adaptations to be able to live you know, like handrails, extra handrails being put in. There is absolutely nothing that anyone can do to force a landlord to make those adjustments, even though you'd think the Equality Act would apply and be discriminating. Um, you can't force a landlord to spend money doing it. It might be different if you can show that these were agreed at the point of agreeing to the tenancy. There are accessibility needs, therefore it's agreed that you will put in, say, ramps if it's, you know, wheelchair accessible then, you've got a contractual obligation to do it. But outside of that, for some, it just doesn't seem like equality rights, reasonable adjustments apply if that would require a landlord spending money or even not spending money, even if the council is willing to fund it, they can't make a landlord do it as well. 
it's not fair, it's not right. It's why the private rented sector really doesn't work to people with accessibility needs. But that is what I think how it works, unfortunately. It's not right. Thanks. Um we're at time now. Um uh we're I'm just gonna round things up, but uh, but yeah, thank you so much for uh for uh setting out yeah all that really really helpful information i learned a lot there uh, i'm going to be going on to the deposit schemes websites to find out uh what uh <laughs> what fair wear and tear is um because uh yeah i wasn't uh i wasn't familiar with that so that's that, that's very helpful um I'm, I'm sure yeah uh in in the chat we've had we've had comments saying how useful this, this has been so th thanks so much um i'm gonna just uh quickly um if, if anyone watching uh, is a student and has not signed up for uh, to Generation Rent, I'm just going to do a little plug. It's uh, generationrent.org uh, slash student hyphen sign up um, to, uh, to get involved with our work that we're doing with students um, and to make sure that, that students are well served by the uh, rental market. Um, we're, uh, you can follow us on social media as well. We're Gen Rent UK. Uh, on Twitter, um, we're Generation Rent UK on Instagram and Facebook. Um, thanks again to Nick and Al. Um, really, really valuable information, and thanks so much for for sparing time this evening. Um, we're uh, everyone who's attended will will send you a, an email to follow up just to check uh, how you found it and what we can do uh, differently next time. But uh, yeah, thanks again, and um, yeah, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Bye.